in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada mountains. People were heading to work or off to school. I take my son to school and um, he looks up at the sky and he says, Mom, there's a big cloud of smoke. We're running late, so it was a little chaos. Let's go, let's go. Making lunches, get dressed, get ready, let's go. They got ready. I walked outside, and as I walk outside to walk to my truck that's in the back, the sky right there, and not over here, was blue. Over there was like orange. And I was like, wow, that's a weird sunrise. And I'm thinking, as I get in the truck and I'm driving away, I'm like, oh, we don't have those colors in the morning. I was working out of town for the week, working construction for pg e doing some dirt work on the road. And uh, yeah, <laughs> went from there. <laughs> So what'd you hear? And We what? had heard um, one of the guys, one of the foremen had heard that there was a fire in the Feather River Canyon. Normal fire, didn't think nothing of it. So I called my dad because I knew he was home. And, and I, another buddy of mine had called me who lives in town here. And he had said, dude, it's pretty bad. Like, there's, everything's blown up fire all over. <laughs> but, uh, so, called my dad, he said, yeah, it's pretty bad. Pretty bad would turn out to be an understatement. Holy cow. With wind gusts approaching hurricane strength, the fire raced from canyon to canyon. Local authorities started a chaotic attempt to evacuate. Heavenly Father, please help us. Yeah, see, we're, we're all dropping down, down into two lanes here. Well, as long as we're alive, right? Yep. Please help us to be safe. Traffic is not moving. It should not take me three hours to get off of a half a mile long road. And. I just wasn't sure. I really wasn't sure if we were going to be making it out, at least by car. I don't think anyone would ever believe this. I thought that I was going to have to figure out if I was going to have to leave my animals, if I was going to have to ditch my car with everything in it. We're not safe standing in the middle of the road, trying to escape the fire from maybe catching on both sides or from the trees. If I had to run, where am I going to go? Like, how, how are we going to make it so that I don't burn to death trying to escape? Most of the smaller roads lead to this main drag running right through town. It's called Skyway. And by 10.30 that morning, Skyway was a parking lot on fire. I'd have moments of freak out, cry, hyperventilate. Then I'd say, I have to get strong. I have to make it through this kind of seemed like all hell broke loose. Like I couldn't get a hold of her. She was crying and driving and... Um... That's when I made that phone call to my husband. That one was pretty devastating. I mean, just, I, I missed her phone call. Uh, all the towers went out, so cell phone service dropped. If we don't make it out, I tried. I will try everything to make sure we get out. But if we don't, I'm sorry. I tried, don't be mad at me. I love you, just... I tried calling her back probably 500 times and she didn't answer. I'm sorry. So at that point, that's the last message you heard from her? Yep. And then you couldn't get through to her? Couldn't get through to her. It took about three hours for her to show back up at my work. And what did you do when you saw Joe? I cried. I gave him a hug. I tried not to, I'm a little bit more emotional than he is, but I tried not to freak out and melt and I tried to stay as strong as I could and just let him know what we had gone through and I felt relief and once I was with him and could kind of say it, it was now we need to find our family. So. What did he say about the message you left him? Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you.
While residents were fighting to leave paradise, first responders were heading towards the flames. What they saw was shocking. Fire engineer Colleen Moldovan, on the second day of his vacation, rushed back to the fire station. It was chaotic. It was apocalyptic. Uh, I didn't know if the rest of the world was ending, but this world that involved paradise was ending at that time. It's like a war zone. All traffic on Pearson needs to be stopped. The chaoticness of, of things are pretty contagious. So you start to feel that something is not right, something is terribly wrong, and a lot of people are gonna get hurt. The entire day, first day, I just constantly told myself a lot of people are gonna die. A lot of people are gonna get hurt. We were expecting 1,500 to 2,000 people to die. I hope it's less, but it, it's not unrealistic or out of the realm of possibility that that's how many people will die. Oh my God. All the way down the road. Oh my God. The fire had consumed both sides of the road with heavy involvement as it was moving from one side to the other. And um, we had no way out. So there was uh, a paradise, two paradise police officers, a Butte County Sheriff, and myself. We all went and met at the head of that intersection, right where Skyway and Clark meet. I said, What's, what do we have? I said, we, we can't go down this way. We can't go down this way. It's pretty much, we're trapped. Get out of your vehicle and go to the Optimo. We all made the decision that it was time to start moving people because there's a reflex time. Get out of your cars, let's go! If you and I want to get in the parking lot, it takes time for us to stand up and walk over there. It does the same with 150 people. Stop! And some of them are in wheelchairs, some of them are elderly, some of them are young, some of them are angry, some of them are upset, some of them are crying, some of them are in that shell shock state. So it takes quite a bit of time to move, and we made the decision that we're gonna put them in the parking lot. There's a couple of different structures that were there with metal roofs. Uh, we would be able to utilize them if it got to the point where we needed to take refuge from direct flame heat. We could move them into the structure. So our first plan was the parking lot. And then as it got worse, we'd go into the structures. And then once the structures got involved, we'd come back out to the parking lot. And we were hoping some of the radiant heat that would be around the parking lot uh, would dissipate. There was people that wanted to help. There was people that were really, really agitated and yelling, not necessarily at me, but just in general. That was the only volume that they had. There was others that just sat down, grabbed their steering wheel and looked forward. We had a gas station directly next to us, um, ammunition depot south of us, propane field north of us, and the fire had wrapped around on both sides of this bowl. If you want to talk about piercing screams, the residents that owned those homes were in that parking lot with us. And to have them yell and cry and scream and beg and say, why aren't you doing anything? was really hard to take. Let me know if you guys need anything, man. We're, 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 these doors. we're standing around gathering people up, so. Yeah, we're gonna have to start shuffling them once we get to that point. Okay. So we're gonna go into this building. All right. And uh, as luck would have it at the most appropriate time, the engines started coming up Skyway and the rest of the uh, engines came in pretty much like the cavalry. They came in uh, at the perfect time. So once all of those engines came in, the risk for the public had severely uh, diminished. By mid-afternoon, most residents of Paradise had made it to safety. 85 didn't make it out. The death toll, while staggering, was much lower than expected. It's a miracle, it's amazing, it's whatever you want to call it, that that many people didn't die.
I mean, this thing was really bad. Richard, we are seeing things we have never seen before. We are hearing stories we've never heard before. I mean, husbands separated from wives, thousands of people trapped in a burning town. A safe zone, that's a patch of asphalt that's on fire and surrounded by a gas station, a propane station, and an ammo depot? Just, just crazy. The word that I heard from almost everybody was apocalyptic. I can't imagine the trauma that everybody experienced here. Yeah. The day after the fire, they took a tour up through town with the fire chief to see the devastation or to see the town. And what I did see was devastating. And it was like watching a real bad movie, a real bad scene in a real bad movie. I mean, there was power poles down everywhere. There was lines all over the place. I mean, it looked like a war zone. You had to dodge and weave and, you know, go up and around and over and... But basically, yeah, we just rolled into town and just started making the rounds, checking things. Luckily, I didn't see anything that, you know, was, I mean, obviously, it all was horrifying, but I didn't come across anything that I didn't want to come across. And I don't know, it just, it was almost, it was, it was surreal, like a bad dream, like you just wanted to wake up. In Paradise, there were 18,000 structures that burnt, thousands of vehicles. The entire infrastructure was gone. And what was the town left with at the end? About 5 million tons of bent, twisted, burnt metal like this. Now, 5 million tons translates to about 350,000 dump trucks that had to go to the landfill. And there are about a half a million dead or dying trees that have to be cut down and carted away. Can they rebuild from this? Well, from my perspective, as a city manager, local government, any form of government, um, we don't leave a sinking ship, right? A burning town. We stay and we, you know, we rescue and we um, then uh, assess, evaluate, uh, find out what needs to be done, who needs help, you know, rescue, and then we start um, the recovery process. Paradise has a large group of very strong, united people, and I'm proud to be from this town, and I want to come back. But shortly after all this devastation, small signs began to emerge. Paradise was not going to give up. It was a beautiful community where people really cared about each other, and they decided to rebuild. The debris removal crews actually saved our town for us so we could rebuild. Hundreds of uh, crews uh, came in and uh, dump trucks lined the streets. There were tractors um, everywhere you, you looked. There were properties being cleared. People complained about the dump trucks, but um, it, they actually saved us. If you're going to rebuild, Every home needs some basic infrastructure services, water, electricity, gas. Let's start with water. Water normally is your friend during a fire. You use it to put the fire out. But a fire this intense in Paradise had some unintended consequences with the water supply system. Michael Lindquist is a water expert. Hello, Michael. How are you? Good morning, Richard. What happened here? Take us through it. So as the fire roared through town, obliterating the structures, the service lines in each structure were opening up and letting the water flow out, essentially draining our system. It drained all of our tanks, yep. it drained all of our pipelines. Right. Uh, the system depressurized. And as the system depressurizes, it starts beginning to pull in air into the system where there's no more water. So normally the water's pushing this way all the time, all the time, all the time. Now it breaks everywhere, so now it starts going the other way, pulling contaminants the wrong way. That's right. So when the contaminants go the wrong way and enter our system, they can either attach to the walls, or they can actually leach into the pipe walls. So when we fill it back up with clean water, it'll desorb back into that clean water, contaminating it. 
we are finding we have 172 miles of uh, water mains. 172 miles? So over a million feet. Wow. Luckily, of standing homes, we're finding a very small percentage of their service laterals to be contaminated. But on burned parcels, we're finding between one third and one half of their service well, laterals. Wasn't there like 11,000 burnt? You got 11,000 trenches to run from here out to the water supply? That's correct. You got some serious job ahead of you. We do. Wow. None of this new infrastructure is worth the money if people don't come back. Paradise has plenty of problems, but that's not one of them. That brought this old house to town. We're following three families as they rebuild their lives. I never had a second thought. Luke was one of the last to leave Paradise that momentous day. He and Crystal will be among the very first to return to a new house. It's hometown. I mean, if we can help rebuild it, then you know, it's that much more satisfying to know that we were part of helping this town come back. But I, you know, I lost stuff in the fire, but like what Crystal lost with our kids' stuff. That was hard. Um, but things are replaceable. You can rebuild a house. So that's what we're doing. <laughs> You up for giving me a tour? Yeah. Absolutely. How similar is this house to the one that was here? The shell is the same. The house, the structure, we didn't change any walls. Basically, before we had the TV entertainment center was here, big man's recliner, and then we had a big sectional couch. So it was still an open floor plan. You could see this, the gas stove from the fire, from the couch. Yeah. And we just. That was beautiful. That was nice. Didn't spend a whole lot of time in here, but I mean, it was just kind of the weekends or Sundays, I guess, would be the relaxed time. Which yeah. one of you gets the big man's recliner? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it looks like you're down to the finishes. I mean, they're spraying paint today. How long until you get back in? Probably four to six weeks. We're hoping. Yeah. Well, we'll be back to check it out. Appreciate the tour. Yeah, Fantastic. for sure. Looking forward to it. Anna and Jose have just begun the rebuilding process. They met with a builder and hope to break ground in a few weeks. When did you know you were going to rebuild? Basically, as soon as I knew that it was gone, I knew I was rebuilding. How did you know that? Because I want to come back. Joe, Avonlea, and their daughter had a permit to rebuild seven months after the fire. That's just how me and my wife are. We kind of like, you know, what we like, so just rebuilding it, you know, same, same style, basically, but a little bit bigger. How do you feel when you see the house under construction? <sighs> it's stressful. I'm trying not to let it get to me because I know in the end it is going to be beautiful and it is going to be what I want, but the process is, it's very stressful. Well, the town continues to issue building permits, and you can imagine in a year or two, there'll be thousands of new homes built in this town. But when you look around, you realize this is still a danger zone. And it begs the question, can you build a house that is fire resistant or retardant? Yep, and the town is going to adopt those building codes for these fire prone um, areas. They may even go beyond it. But you know, Tommy's working with one of our builders and he's got to answer those exact questions. For sure. Hey, Brett. Hi, Tommy. Making good headway on the framing here. Yeah, we are. In 2008, California changed the building code to make homes more fire resistant. Between 2008 and the fire, Paradise had 350 homes built using the new code. Half of those survived the fire. By contrast, only 18% of the homes built before the new code survived. Brett Whalen is a local builder who showed me key features of the new code. Let's take a look. All right, let's go. Siding must be a fire-resistant material like stucco. Windows should be tempered glass. Roofs must be Class A fire resistant. It's also important to make sure embers can't get into the building through the vents. These vents here have the honeycomb on the interior, which you can see from that view. Yeah. You can also see in the back. I see it also has a wire on it. Yeah, the wire keeps the bugs out. The honeycomb keeps the embers out. So what happens with this honeycomb? I mean, the honeycomb collapses with heat. The radiant heat the from radiant outside. The radiant heat yeah. from the outside ends up closing the embers off and oh. allowing the embers not to get through the vent, especially from this side here. Well, what if you had a house and you wanted to retrofit? Do you have to take these out and replace them? Uh, no, you don't. You actually have these retrofit 
these honeycomb retrofit that actually fits on the back side. So in this in this case here, you put it right here. Cut it to fit. And you'd have some metal that goes, metal strapping that goes over the top so they don't fall off. Mm -hmm. But the idea of this is really to give the homeowner time to get out of the building. Correct, you wanna give them at least one hour. You know, that's it's a minimum one hour rated assembly. Well, it makes a lot of sense to me. All right, and thanks for this tour. All right, thank you. You know, it was pretty uh, amazing to talk to Brent about the new building code that was established in 2008. It's obviously working because, like I said earlier, half of the houses built in that time period were saved. That's great. So, guys, sadly,